I think this is our <clears throat> this morning is our fourth sermon on the same passage of scripture. And we could keep going and going on this one event. <clears throat> uh, but this will be our final message from this passage of scripture. We've been looking at the event that took place in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I invite you please to turn there. <clears throat> So in Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, once again we will read this passage. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gates of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. He fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This morning, I want us to put our focus where our focus has been on Peter and John in the past and our focus has been very much on who Christ is last week. This morning, if you would join with me, I would like us to look at the beautiful gate of the temple and for our eyes to land on a man who has been born lame. And because he's been born lame, day after day, he's brought there to beg. And this day that he's brought to beg is a day like any other Peter and John are walking to the temple and they are not like any other people who have walked by him. Something has transformed them radically. And so when they see him, everyone sees him, but when they see him, and I'd like you to notice, they actually looked and noticed him. They got his attention. And he's expecting to receive something that, oh, he had no idea what he was about to receive. Let's con consider for a moment this man. He cannot heal himself. If he could have healed himself, he would have. This man has been sitting there year after year after year after year. And he cannot heal himself. What is needed in his life is an intrusion, an interruption. And, and Peter and John are the vessels of that interruption that's about to enter into this man's daily existence. As the disciples of Jesus, now the apostles of Jesus, carrying on the ministry of Jesus, remember that these two men went out. The Lord sent them out in twos. I don't know who went with who, but he sent them out in twos. And he had already given them authority to heal diseases while he was still doing his earthly ministry here. They have done this before. And so when they're walking towards the temple, the temple that had rejected Christ, the rulers that had cried for Jesus' crucifixion, these two men of God usher in an intrusion into his life. And if I may, they are the intrusion. They are unlike anyone else. First, I'd like you to consider this. 
this man represents Adam and all of his seed. That man represents the entire human race. Lame, fallen, crippled, disabled, and unable to do anything about that condition. Sitting at the temple of God. And I need you to understand this. God loved the beggar and looked at us, at the race of man, and intruded into our existence. He intruded into our history with the author of life. We have seen in the last weeks that right now you are living in the era of proclamation. Adam's race is still fallen. God is still looking. His eyes are on the beggars. And when I'm, I'm talking about the beggars, the, the ones that concern me the most are the ones who have it all together, good jobs, great education, wonderful marriages. They don't even realize that they are spiritually dead. They don't even realize that they are nothing of what humanity was supposed to be, that they are crippled in every sense. <laughs> And God loves that person and sent you to have eyes to look upon them and the power of the Holy Spirit to speak the gospel message into their life so that they can be born again, be new creatures in Jesus Christ. Last night I was reminded, you, you remember, many of you remember, years ago there used to be a concrete culvert out here in the playground area that the kids played on before we could afford playground equipment. You just, you, gra you grabbed cast off construction equipment and just stuck it on there. Go play on it, boys. Go inside, get a band aid. Mom will, mom will pack that up. And so there was a culvert that sat out there that was five foot diameter. That's how big it was, concrete. It was probably seven or eight feet long, laid on its side. And when I stood up to it, it was like this and hollow inside. It was a concrete culvert. One day we had a youth activity here. And I was here as the youth pastor at that time. And the kids were doing their things and they had invited some of their friends to the youth activity, and so I went outside, and I found a teenager sitting inside of that culvert. He was a visitor. I crawled in there with him and sat down. He had cuts all up his arm where he had been. He, he was a cutter, which is the next step before suicide. And he was sitting inside of the concrete culvert, crying. And I sat down next to him. And I said, what is it? And he said, with tears running down his face, I just wish I could be born all over. And I said, son, have I got some news for you. And I shared with him that Jesus loved him and died for him and wanted him to live not just today and not just tomorrow, but he wanted him to have eternal life and he wanted to heal him and heal his heart and heal his mind. And though everyone else might have rejected him, he absolutely was accepted by the king of the universe. And so he repented of his sins. And he asked Christ to become his Lord. And we baptized him. And he was like the beggar, leaping for God. This is the era of proclamation because God is intruding in the lives of the needy. And you are the vessels.
few weeks ago, I was looking at a passage of Scripture. I'm going to ask you to turn there, Titus chapter 2. You see, the problem is, because Adam's children are all very active. Adam's children are moving. They're getting into cars and dashing here and there. They're getting onto airplanes and getting stuck in airports, and they're losing their luggage, and they're arguing, and they're voting, and they're fussing, and they're twittering. Adam's children are so busy that they don't even realize that they are dead. There is so much activity, but there is absolutely no life at all. They are a corpse. See, when Peter intrudes, when Peter sees the beggar sitting there, Peter says, look at me. And then he speaks a name. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. In the book of Titus, Chapter 2, look at verses 11 through 14. For the grace, I'm going to read it in its entirety and then we'll break it down. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let us begin with this. For the grace of God has appeared. Now, grace is invisible, isn't it? Grace is invisible. It's a concept. But Paul says, grace has appeared. God's grace that we can see that has appeared is Jesus Christ himself. So picture this, if you would. Here here is a graveyard. There's a graveyard. And and the folks aren't buried six foot deep. Uh, They were were a a little... trench was dug for them and they were laid out there and a little sprinkling of dirt was put on them so you can see their faces, you can see their bodies they're not all the way bare and and as far as you can see here is a graveyard filled with people and suddenly the author of life, Jesus Christ begins walking through there grace has appeared and, and you, myself, Mitch, our eyes opened, we saw him, and we stood upright in the newness of life. And all of the rest of humanity is still stretched out and laid out. And you are standing vertical because of the power of Jesus Christ. Grace, God's grace, has appeared to us. And then he walked to the end of the graveyard and he left and said, I'll be back. And there you are standing upright in a graveyard filled of prostrate people. Why do you think he left you here? To proclaim the age of grace. To speak the name of Jesus to any of Adam's lost children who open their eyes and see you. They see you standing upright and they're going, how do you do that? By the blood of Jesus Christ I stand before you. By a miracle, a miracle greater than the recovery of Gene's voice, I was in the shallow grave waiting for somebody to dig the permanent one. And grace appeared. One of his, one of those that he saved, spoke the message to me. And I'm looking at the one 
that spoke the message. And he looked at me and he said, now you, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And I became a friend. This is the age of proclamation and you live in a graveyard. Now, if you want, you can go ahead and get down and try to make yourself comfortable. You can decorate the grave if you would like. You can, you can put some lights on the tombstone. Maybe put a garage door opener that just automatically opens and closes. You can do all kinds of things to this graveyard. But it will always be a graveyard. And you're, what he calls us to do is to stand upright and he says, I'm coming back. And I will take you out of here. Hallelujah. I'm coming back, and I'm going to gather you. Now, with that construct in mind, let's look again at this passage of Scripture. For the grace of God, the only begotten Son of God, the author of life, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, has appeared to us bringing salvation for all people. Who can come? Any who will may come. Who can be born again? Any who will. Bringing salvation for all people. Now watch this. Now he's talking to you upright people. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in the present There is no way you can look at a lost child of Adam and say, look at me, if you're, if you're down in the slop with them. Now, if I'm laying in a shallow grave, I can't even see anybody unless they're standing upright. We are to maintain our upright position because he has left us here to just be standing pillars and testimonies to the appearance of God's grace. Then what? Okay, I'm not supposed to be ungodly. I'm not supposed I'm supposed to stand upright waiting for our blessed hope. Waiting for our blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. I am standing here upright waiting eyes to the sky. He's going to come and get me any minute. Uh, get up. In the name of Jesus, get up. He's going to come any minute. He's going to gather everyone who's upright. Everyone who's not upright is going to perish. He's coming any minute. Stand up. Look at me. Look at me. I stand here in the name of Jesus. I live a resurrected life. I am free from sin and ungodliness. And you look at them and you say, look at me. Look at me. You too can have life. In the name of Jesus, stand up. We're waiting for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. If you really want a definition of what life is all about, there it is. You are either in the grave, without life, waiting for your eternal destination, or you are standing upright in godliness and righteousness, waiting for the appearance of your king to take you to your blessed hope. When Peter said to the beggar, look at me. That's at the very beginning of the age of the proclamation. And you and I are at the very end of it. He launched it. And we are faithfully going to continue that work until that last trumpet sounds. And our blessed hope appears. And then... 
My eyes are not going to be on the last sons of Adam anymore. They will no longer be in my mind. They will not be my responsibility. But my face will turn to the glorious face of my Redeemer. And I will be caught up in his beauty and carried away. He doesn't even need to make him fly. Just that beauty will launch us into heaven. A new heaven and a new earth. And no more graveyard ever. So Peter and, and, and John were arrested, of course, for speaking in the name of Jesus. They were arrested for healing a lame man. Because it annoyed the religious rulers. I, I, just, I just get a kick out of that. They were annoyed. Yet, yes, I know the guy's healed, but... Man, it just ticks me off. <laughs> Why? Because that man standing, I won't even look at him. I'm not even going to look at him. That man standing over there, his existence is saying that we were wrong and this person that we killed actually was our Messiah. So they're annoyed. They bring Peter and John. Why are you preaching in the name of that the elders have determined to be a false messiah. What is Peter and John's answer? Look! There's the evidence. In fact, Peter and John said, you didn't know what you were doing. Right now, if you'll repent, right now if you'll turn from your position of calling him a false messiah, and you will turn to him right now, right now is the day of salvation for you, Caiaphas. high priests, rulers of the synagogues, princes of Judah, right now, he's still proclaiming. Here are his words in Acts 4, 9-12. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is the proclamation. Well, Now, you have it. It's been given to you. You have it. You have it. It's been given to you. You have it. And everywhere you walk, the beggar is laying by the door of the temple, looking for something. Everywhere you go, everyone you see, in your school. It's a graveyard, the school. Kids growing up having no idea, having never heard, and you have it, Ezra, in your workplace. You're the one standing vertical. It's you. No one else. The proclamation was entrusted to you by Jesus Christ himself. He did not make a mistake. You might, but he didn't. He has given you the words. He has filled you with his Holy Spirit. More than anything else, he has given you a command. Stand up, live in righteousness, and proclaim why. What did you hear today? It's our privilege to stand in his behalf. What else did you hear today? <laughs> Gene, you heard Gene. What else did we hear today? The evidence of things not seen. What else? Look at the graveyard and rise up. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> We're going to annoy you. Very good. Lay down. 
You're casting a shadow on my plot. Right? I'm trying to get a tan here. What else did you hear? He's coming again. Stand up firmly. Stay upright. He made you upright. Stay upright. Anything else? It is the age of proclamation. You're probably wondering, why is he ending so soon? Because I looked at how long the last sermons were, and they were nearly an hour, so I'm giving you a break today. I'm going to ask the worship team to come.